We are live. Yes. <laughs> are we? Are we? We are live. We are live. We are live. Yes. Yep. Do you want to just go live since we're late anyway? Yeah. Let's do this. Cool. Let me let me close all the distractions. So this is live. This is live. Awesome. We are live, guys. Sorry, face some technical challenges. Um, we see people live join us. This is awesome. Hello, hello, hey guys, this is Dr. Nancy Lee. Welcome to Product Insider. Today we have a special guest, Ari Paparo, and he's an ex uh, senior director from Google and currently uh, uh, CEO of Launch Science. He has a lot of insider tips for all of you guys. So let's get started today and, and quick introduction regarding what we do on this podcast. Hey guys, this is Dr. Nancy Lee. I'm passionate about all things product, career growth, and nonprofit. I'm on a mission to help uh, people create amazing products that impact millions of people's lives while getting the worldwide balance you deserve. Welcome to Product Insider. Shy away from the real talk? No way. We're covering everything from imposter syndrome, people management, and barriers facing the product leader of tomorrow. We are joined by fan level product leaders to get a lowdown on what's hot right now. And I'm your host, Dr. Nancy Lee. I moved to the US with $800 in my pocket and became a director of product within four years. Now I run product manager accelerator courses that make product management careers available to everybody. Are you ready? Welcome to Product Insider. Awesome. So how are you, Ari? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Dr. Nancy Lee. Uh, this is a really exciting uh, opportunity and an interesting podcast. Yeah, thank you for uh, uh, spending your valuable time to join us as well. So today's, today's podcast actually focuses on product launches and actually product manager job doesn't stop at the product launches. I know you're the expert of launching product and based on my research about your background, I know you're actually a serious entrepreneur and, and started many startups and sold your startup to Fortune Financial companies like Comcast and also joined Google and later on became the senior director at Google and now you are as an expert upon launches because it just are your own startup teaching people and actually providing their software to help companies to launch their product called Launch Science. So Ari, um, can you give an overview about your background? I know this is only like sketch of sure. everything you have done. Yeah, tell us more regarding your background and audience learn about you. Yeah, so I have been in product management and leadership roles for about 20 years. I was part of the team that sold DoubleClick uh, to Google, which was a $3 billion acquisition, and then I joined awesome. Google. I've been an advertising technology specialist for most of my career. Um, my most recent stint was with a company I founded called Beeswax that uh, was a very API-driven ad tech platform. Think of it as like Stripe for ad tech, and that mm -hmm. was sold to Comcast in 2021. Um, and Congrats. I, yeah, it was, it was great. Comcast is a great company. People underestimate how much tech is inside Comcast. Um, in addition to being, I think this, either the largest or the second largest media company in the world. Um, and then, uh, about a year ago, based on all my experience, every single company I worked at small and big has a very undefined and ad hoc process for launching products. The go to market, it, you, it could be good, but it's, they invent it from scratch every single time. And mm -hmm. who owns it? Sometimes product management, sometimes marketing. Sometimes there's a separate group called product operations. It's very, it, so the process is undefined. The people who are responsible for it 
vary a lot and there's no tooling there's no SaaS software for product launches which is crazy when you think about it um mm -hmm. so based on that experience i started a new company uh, about we've been doing it for about a year we've been in stealth until last month and it's called launch science and it's the first SaaS platform for helping companies to launch uh their products and features more effectively this is awesome. So Ari, you touched a really good point regarding this no set process and each company's definition of launching a product is different and yeah. who's responsible or responsible for it is very different. Let's talk uh, regarding bigger companies first. Yeah, okay. So what's the process of launching a 100 million product and why launching product is the hardest part of management life cycle. It's from the top first, the larger ones. Yeah, sure. So at a larger company, usually it's a team that is uh, jointly owned by the product manager who faces mm -hmm. inward mostly, and the product marketer who faces outward. And, yeah. the, and they will uh, be the heads of the team and then they'll bring together sort of a smattering of people from different groups, sales, service, documentation, legal, mm -hmm. finance, all those sort of things. Um, and for a big launch, if you want to make be a hundred million dollar product, you better have enough time. That's really an issue. People don't put enough time into this. They think that, you know, the day the code ships is the day that we launch. So that's just should not, that is a bad way of doing things. You need time. That's far, far <laughs> away from real launches. I think um, it really depends on who you talk to. The talk to engineers, I'm done, I ship my code. Then talk to marketers, like, <laughs> Yeah, there's no sales, so the marketers doesn't doesn't count the launch. Yeah. Right. So for a big launch, maybe two months, maybe three months in advance, you're really mm -hmm. working on this. It could be longer in different industries. If you have regulatory requirements, or if you have a lot of enterprise customers that need an adoption cycle, maybe it's even longer. Um, mm -hmm. And you're and you're working that whole time, and you're figuring out what documents need to be created, training, uh, com communications, approvals. You know, you can't just write a press release at a big company. You need it needs to go through twenty different levels of approval, translations mm -hmm. for different markets. Um, and that that workflow is uh, cross functional, which makes it difficult. It's undefined, yeah. um, and uh, it's some of it's quite hard, um, right? It's not not mm -hmm. easy to figure out, um, you know, why is this feature or this product actually important to the target consumer, and how do you communicate it in such a way that really brings them to the table? That's that's a, that's more of a soft comms issue, but it's yeah. all part of the same effort, right? Um, yeah. Especially when you mentioned um, this different company had different process and different people yeah. involved. And actually, I speak to my own pain point. And two years ago, I helped Verizon to launch the first 5G edge computing product in collaboration mm. with AWS and Azure. And at the time, not only internally, we need to launch it and externally, we need to work with multiple different companies. And you're yeah. right, all the legal standpoint and also who do you talk to? The messaging is different. And mm -hmm. when you talk to customers, do you prioritize certain segment or you want to make it broad to make it to everybody? Right. So very different. So, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, please continue. So we talk about the people involved and messaging is different. Um, yeah. What are the process involved in launching like hard and big product? <laughs> yeah. Um, well, so um, I've spoken to maybe 30, 40 companies at this point in in-depth mm -hmm. interviews to find out how they do it. Um, and so step one is triage. It's We have to all agree, is this a big release or not? There's actually a mm -hmm. big problem where sometimes the pro every product manager is ambitious and they want yeah. to they want their product to be the one that people talk about in the Wall Street Journal and it gets excited yeah. and that's not the case. So there there has to be alignment because sometimes marketing will say to product management this thing that you're dedicating your life to it's not that important we're not spending money on it sorry <laughs> uh, you know and that's that's a tough one um, so, so triage. Which means everyone that has to be on page cool so which means that company had different priorities. In, in terms well, of how much marketing budget they put on different products. So some absolutely. like smaller ones, you don't you don't get enough support when you launch a product. Exactly. And so the best practice huh. is that at an executive level, you agree on sort of a tiering system. What does large mean? What does medium mean? What does small mean? And how much effort do each of those take? And let's look at the roadmap for the next 12 months with product management and put a little LM and or S next to each one of those things so that mm -hmm. we don't have, we're not disconnected. Um, so that's step one. Step two, create the team. I already talked about that. It's always cross-functional and you need people who have the time and effort to do things. The biggest mistake, especially at more of a small, medium-sized company, is you mm -hmm. assign a task that's vital to the product uh, launch to someone who sees it as sort of an extra credit assignment. 
Like some support oh. guy, some support guy or girl is given the job of writing writing the release notes for the documentation center, and they have a real job. They're just doing it because, like, hey, that's fun. I'll do that. That's no. It, it, but they why need is to it have assigned? the time? Um, well, because yep. so, sometimes you don't have a dedicated person. Maybe there isn't like sales training would be another example. Not every company has a dedicated L and D learning and development team, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. and so you need to train the sales force. Who's going to do it, right? So, so very often someone will raise their hand. Some ambitious younger person will say, "Oh, I'm in sales. I'll do the sales training." Oh. No, they need to have the resources necessary to do the job. Exactly. This reminds me. When, <laughs> so funny. So when I launched the. Um, the 5G edge computing product and as well as the smart cities product for Verizon years ago, I was one day training and mm -hmm. I thought there is learning and development center, even in Verizon, I thought it's mm -hmm. like, they're going to take over, <laughs> but when they, <laughs> but it's not, it's not, I, they, they, they took it over after it's really mature. Right. After it's right. very, very mature, they know everything about messaging, but at very beginning when we need to sell to, let's say, a few beta customers, and I train my sales guys. It, mm -hmm. Yes, I need training. I see. And then nobody teach me how to train sales guys. I just figure out myself. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, uh. and, and that's a sales is actually a big um, uh, problem, pain point in this whole process because sales has, it has its own momentum. You know, salespeople are mm -hmm. also ambitious. They want to make their number. Totally. They want to sell things. And you have, it's very easy to have misalignment where they try to sell <coughs> things that are not the right things to sell, like wrong customer mm -hmm. type for the product, but they, but they want to make money. So they try to fit it in or the opposite. They don't realize where the opportunities are. Um, mm -hmm. So um, the go to market process needs to really work through some of these nuances. Um, and unfortunately, it, it, it very often is that either product marketer person or product manager who has to do the legwork to figure out what the mechanisms are that will make sales successful because mm -hmm. sales leadership may not really be staffed or operate that way. Um, so, exactly. um, so the kind of the next stage is you do the work, like you're creating documents, you're creating trainings, you're getting alignment, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. That could take a while. Right. And that yeah. is where you also have a lot of approvals, a lot of legal, a lot of partnership approvals, a lot of back and mm -hmm. forth. This is like the pro project management, uh, problem from hell, basically. Um, and, <laughs> and so what we found is, you know, when we talk to customers to do it, you know, everyone uses a spreadsheet, Google Doc, whatever, to keep uh -huh. track of all this stuff. Ganchar, it's really Ganchar, tough. Yeah. It's a Gantt chart. It's really tough. Um, and that's one of the things our product does. Uh, but that, mm -hmm. that's one of the things you have to do. Um, mm -hmm. You tend to do weekly or biweekly meetings with the whole team, like that team mm -hmm. of five to 10 people who's in charge of the launch. You're meeting every two weeks, going through the list. How are you doing? What are the blockers? How can we, how can we move you forward? Um, right. And then kind of the last sort of step or, or time is like the, the real like crunch time, the one or two weeks, or it could be longer, depending on how, how complex your org is, mm -hmm. where you're, you're ready to launch. And now you're yeah. doing the sales training and you're getting the feedback and you have the beta mm -hmm. customers and you're getting that feedback. And that is, uh, can be very intense because you could go off the rails very easily and find out, oh no, we forgot to, you know, do this legal compliance issue or someone brought up this major issue with, you know, the way we bill it. Um, and, yeah. and that's where you could, you could delay the launch, which no one wants, or you just have to work even harder and, and have those, those people kind of coordinating very tightly. Like working as a McKinsey consultant, 24 like Basically, <laughs> it's your full-time job, right? <laughs> yeah. Hey, um, all right. Something interesting when you talk about this, no standard process, but mm -hmm. Clearly, when you launch a company, you make sure that people follow your process because you mm -hmm. learn it from the best, right? Um, but this is also a very interesting quote. Earlier when I discussed with you regarding, hey, do you learn it from Google, blah, 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 and you said it. <laughs> Google actually is the worst in terms of launching product, <laughs> organizing everything. So tell me why. I thought it is from Google, then you put it to launch signs, but it was the right. worst. So tell us more. What's going on? Yeah, so um, I love Google. First, a lot of some people think I don't like Google because I criticize them, but it's because I love them. I, I love Gmail. I love their ad products. I'm not a Google hater, but my God, <gasps> man, they have some real problems. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, so I, think I agree. <laughs> I, I think fundamentally, um, it's an incentives problem, which is that Google product managers and engineering managers are evaluated based on their shipping products. 
right? They mm. when their annual reviews, when their promotion cycles come up, what'd you ship? What what what'd you ship? And they show the big ship. They show like, oh, we released a new messaging app, uh, and it was announced on stage at our conference, and everyone's excited about it. And they're much less incentivized by um, you know hard business results. Um, and uh. um, and so the ship is the whole thing. And then I, a lot of times people move on. Product manager ships something. They're like off to the new thing. The old thing languishes and doesn't have the follow up. It wasn't really right for the market. They don't have cross system, cross company, you know, alignment. Um, it, and I think it's a good contrast of, let's say, Amazon, because Amazon is mm -hmm. also very distributed. You know, they have that two pizza rule. So the teams are very small um, and they are also very incentivized by shipping things. Uh, mm -hmm. But at Amazon, they're very they're so money oriented. They're so focused on revenue that yeah. like just shipping isn't good enough. They want to see the results, right? They want to see mm -hmm. the revenue coming in. Um, and and that kind of, you know, yin and yang on, on the launch process kind of keeps people in yeah. line from launching too many stupid things. They can still mm -hmm. launch stupid things, but they could bring it back. Whereas but they Google, kill they it fast. Throwing things over the transom. Uh, I mean, I mentioned messaging apps because it's just such a joke at this point, how many messaging apps they've had and how many problems they've had with that. Uh, another yeah. example is close to me is in ad tech. So, um, you know, there's this whole move towards privacy and ad tech. Um, mm -hmm. And Apple three years ago announced their solution called ATT. They mm -hmm. announced it at their event and launched it, I think, 120 days later, where they basically cut off a lot of data to advertisers for privacy reasons. Yeah. And people yeah. don't like it, but they went from announcing it to launch it in 120 days, right? Yeah, I hate it too. Google, on the other hand, launched their, they launched, they announced they were removing cookies. Uh, I think we're now two and a half years ago. And uh, mm -hmm. they announced their sandbox, which is their no cookie solution to privacy, two and a half years ago. And it's still it's not still available. It's still not there. Right. Uh, and I think that's just a, a clear contrast in the way these two companies do business. I see, because the KPI is very different. And no, yeah, no wonder, actually, this news, Google actually shut down six of their product in 2023. It's like first right. quarter, they, they took down six. It's crazy. Um, so now, Ari, would you be able to tell us how should, in real life, how should product launch be measured? Was it success metrics. Yeah. So it looks like, for example, as you mentioned, Google is based on the number of products they ship. That's why people just yeah. ship without business impact and Amazon. Um, to be frank, I think Amazon has very good um, revenue generation culture and machine. I heard yeah, the culture right. was like bottom 10 percent out. If you're not generating yeah. enough revenue for things for the company, it's very KPI driven. So mm -hmm. what do you think it should it should be the right way to measure yeah the KPI of product launch. So this is another thing I've learned in my interviews and best practices. The most mm -hmm. important thing is to agree on what the KPI is, right? Mm -hmm. in, in advance of the launch. And you'd be surprised how many people don't. Um, so well, before you're launching the product or feature, you should, you're, as the, the, it varies if it's product manager or marketing. It's usually product management, but sometimes marketing. Uh, you should establish what are you expecting to get out of this launch? Is it mm -hmm. higher higher revenue from a certain segment? Is it lower churn? Is it you know lower costs? There you know what is the KPI? Why are we doing mm -hmm. this? If you can't define the KPI, uh, it's probably a problem. Um, and sure. uh, and then you should get um, you should get um, consensus around what the KPI is. So it's not good if the product group thinks the KPI is a certain thing and then the, the marketing group, especially up at the CMO level, is measuring mm -hmm. something totally different. That's a pretty exactly. big disconnect, right? Yeah. Uh, and then finally, you should actually retrospectively measure it. Um, I was speaking to mm -hmm. a CMO of a pretty big HR company and they have a mm -hmm. single metric, which is, um, in, it's called like employer engagement. It's like a hybrid metric they made up, which is like, do the employers like it, it's a mixed metric that they it calculate internally um, that is about like how many jobs you post and how many how many interviews you do, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it's their own metric. They have it. I don't know what it is. It's their metric. But the important mm -hmm. point is the CMO told me that she actually has a report for every single major product release they've done over the last 12 months about how it moved mm -hmm. that metric up or down. Um, oh. And so... And so when the CEO goes to her and says, like, mm -hmm. why should I approve your budget? You know, you, you need five product marketing people. See this report. report. Hey, report. I, we all agreed smart. this is the most important metric in our company, and I increased it by 7% based on my work. Right? Awesome. Um, hey. That's a best practice. 
I I do like that, but I think depends on size of company. For example, the、mm-hmm. larger they are, the more、mm-hmm. silos they are in they have in the company.、Yeah. I have personally experiences throughout my career. I I work for several Fortune Five Hundred companies, and、mm-hmm. not mention which name, but. One of those Fortune five hundred、uh, companies. I dis- earlier in my career, I discussed with my boss regarding, hey,、uh, what's the KPI for product manager? So who、yeah. gets promotion faster? Who who、mm-hmm. get bonus more? It is based on revenue. He said no, and、um, then he's also direct level. Then he, he he gave back the reason was because he said, if we are product management teams, if we are held accountable for the failure of our sales marketing team. Is not going to incentivize partners to actually work harder because what he said is, if we build amazing product, we do customer interviews, we let engineer to build it, we ship、mm-hmm. it, and then sales marketing they didn't sell it well enough, and then we don't get bonus, we cannot do it. So actually, it's from the top. It's a Fortune five companies from the top. They be say, no product team, mm-hmm, not、yeah. not revenue driven. It's based on ship. A product which equals to Google.、Actually. Yeah, I I don't know. I don't agree with that.、Um, I I think if if it's a good product,、um, it's pretty rare that your sales and marketing would be so bad that it would tank、mm-hmm. it.、Uh, I mean, it's possible certainly, but、um, mm-hmm. I I think it, there's a leveling question here.、Um, it's pretty hard to. Hold a junior product manager, like an associate product manager, to a revenue goal,、um, because they're not they're not at a level where they really control everything relating to a product.、Um, yeah. You, um. So so at the highest level, if you're the CPO, and I have been a CPO of a public company, if you're the CPO,、mm-hmm. you should be aligned with the company's goals. Everything、True. in the company, company success, at the CPO level. If you're、mm-hmm. as you go down, you know if you're the product manager who has a a line of product that rolls up to you and it is、uh, for profit, then revenue probably is a pretty important metric that you should be looking at. Revenue maybe at VP level, your revenue and profitability because you see、mm-hmm. more of it.、Um, but you should be、uh, somewhat aligned with business goals. And if you're in a situation where you're shipping great products and they're not、mm-hmm. selling. You're probably there's probably a bigger problem than your product management org. I think so. I think is if for that reason, first of all, as a product manager, will be a little bit feel sad about I I build a baby. Yeah. Nobody likes my baby. It's very cute, but nobody wanna <laughs> use it, right? I think internally we will feel sad about what、yeah. the purpose of doing the job as a PM. I personally、right. believe that the, lots of re, lots of people out there they choose the profession of being a product manager was because they love. Using technology and creating、yeah. product to change people's lives, actually, like yeah, it, yeah. So this they're also、mm-hmm. they're also very useful metrics like NPS scores, right? If you're、yeah. if you're in a business that's ru- running NPS and、uh, you you as a product manager make the NPS go up, that's pretty important.、Mm-hmm. It might not be the ultimate business goal, but it's a it's a proxy metric. Yeah. Awesome. So Ari, we mentioned regarding the KPI. First of all, you mentioned the team should just align on KPI, and then you gave us examples of the NPS. Do you have any other metrics you think people can use to measure success of launches? Well, it depends on the business, right? If you're、mm-hmm. in the、True. B2C, there are pretty obvious metrics around daily active users and monthly active users and cost of acquisition.、Uh, mm-hmm. In B2B,、um, you know, I, I think it's. You know, revenue, customer retention,、um, you know, NPS are usually the common ones.、Uh, usage is important,、um, especially if you build a new feature within a product suite.、Uh, you want to see usage of, of that、yeah. feature.、Um, usually,、uh, it's a little hard sometimes to connect a, a feature in B two B to a business metric because. You know who knows? Like there are hundreds of people in the pipeline at any time, and you know, did you really increase new revenue, especially with the enterprise sales force? It's kind of hard to tell.、Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. Actually, which also goes back to the responsibilities of senior leaders who define、mm-hmm. what's the true success metrics for the company for、right. the team. That's right. I had a boss who who used to say,、uh, you know, revenue solves all problems.、Uh, I, I agree with that one. <laughs> I I like you get to the point and say yes that's it. it nobody wants to if you're not sales you don't want to really own it but it's true from the company's vision perspective yes revenue、yeah. is the, the alignment to align it yeah, might be messy people might not love your product but if they're paying for it that's a pretty good sign <laughs> yeah means you find for for a product market fit awesome yeah uh cool all right um. I do have a personal question regarding the definition of when per launch should get started. Based、uh-huh. on what you described, am I did I 
Did I understand what you、uh, said correctly? Per launch, sounds like start from code is finished, all the、mm. way until customers start to use it and generating revenue. Is that is that correct?、Uh, no, I don't think that's exactly right.、Uh, that's、mm -hmm. not right. Tell me、least. more.、Um, so、uh, it should align with the sizing. So I mentioned the triage and sizing process. Almost、mm. all companies use a like a t-shirt size, large, medium, small, tiny.、Um, yeah. Some companies have their own. There is they bring in consultants and come up with names for them, like impact, you know, whatever. But it doesn't matter. Large, medium,、nothing. small. Yeah.、Uh, the amount of time is directly correlated to the size. You know,、um, oh, yeah. And so large, you probably need like three months. Medium, one month. Or two months,、oh. small like a couple weeks, or even less for small. It depends on how small small is.、Um, so, so that's the first question. Then the second question is, when should you launch? Like you want to work、mm -hmm. from the launch back to the prep time, right? And、yeah. you should choose when to launch based on what has the biggest business impact for you.、Um, mm -hmm. So Apple being the obvious example, they launch everything once a year. Right,、yeah. and they do a really big event, and they launch everything once per year, and that is in September or October. I get,、mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to be pretty confident that Apple's already working on the agenda for that right now, yeah, a year yeah. in advance at least, right? And, exactly. And so, if Apple, which is literally the best product marketing company on earth,、uh, if they're giving themselves a year to prep for their once a year launch, maybe you should take some time. You know, maybe, maybe you need a little more time than you think you do. To you know get、yeah. everything perfect, but it, for for us non Applers, you know maybe it's a sales conference, maybe it's an event, maybe it's just a good weekend, maybe、mm -hmm. you have a tie in with the Super Bowl and you want to launch three weeks ahead of time to、so、get the buzz going, and then you have your big Super Bowl commercial. You, you it's a it's a when to launch is kind of an art,、um, and、mm -hmm. uh, you should take that very seriously, and you should not base it on when the code is done. Right, the code、yeah. code being done is the minimum date to launch. Actually, you could launch in advance of code being done. You could talk about pre-launch, sure. Yeah, pre-launch. It's also possible, right?、Mm -hmm. um, but the important point is, like, you you have the calendar. You have you know what's coming from the product and engineering group. You have it、mm -hmm. as large, medium, small, and then you just kind of have to think, be a little creative. Like, oh, this one and this one, if we launch at the same time, that might have a really big impact. Or Maybe we want to have a steady drum beat, one new feature every week for the next six weeks, because people don't、oh. think of us as innovation company. So we're just gonna like do small ones every week and send out an email,、um, and that's that's kind of I, I enjoy that. I think it's a fun fun exercise, and it makes a really big impact. Wow, wow! We just learned so much from you regarding different ways to launch product. So Ari,、right, yeah. let's let's ship. Shift a little bit. You gave us many good examples regarding what's the right process, what、yeah. people shift down. Do you have a product? They be like, "This suck." When launch a product, it big <laughs> failure. So tell us the product that had the biggest failure and what's went wrong. So tell us more. Right. In terms of well, launching, like GTM. Yeah, yeah. There's one that comes to mind that's very topical,、uh, which is Twitter Blue. Uh, uh, yes. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm a eight dollars by the way. I'm an avid Twitter user. I love Twitter,、uh, but my God, is it being screwed up?、Um, so everything is possible wrong with Twitter Blue. From,、um, but I'll try to break it down. So、uh -huh. first of all, you know the basic hypothesis that Elon and his team has is that they need to have subscriptions. So first of all, that's not、yeah. going from the customer out. That's going from their needs in. Like they're like,、mm -hmm. I need subscription revenue, so I'm going to charge people. Not asking. That's typical Elon's、want. woman, by the way. It is. Yeah, go ahead. It is. Yeah.、Um, Elon is like many. Sort of very smart product-oriented people, which is they pick the destination and work backwards, right? Which is、uh -huh. good. That's a good technique, but he takes it a little too far.、Um, so his his end goal is: I want to charge for subscriptions, and I want to get rid of bots. The way to do that is with charging. So we're good. We're charging people, right? What he doesn't do is he doesn't、um, care about he he knows, but he doesn't care about what people actually think of what the blue check mark means. It has、mm -hmm. meaning currently. Yeah. He ignores that. He's like, "That's garbage. We're throwing that out the window. It's corrupt." He uses the word "corrupt." Okay, so he misunderstands his customer, and his new thing is all internally focused. He's not caring about what the customers want. He's caring about what he wants,、mm -hmm. right?、Um, so already we're pretty much primed for failure.、Um, then the launch process, to the extent there was one, was he pre-announced it on April first, which is the worst possible day to launch a product all year. So we talked about timing. Never launch on April first because everyone thinks it's an April Fool's it's joke, right? Fake. Yeah, <laughs> right. So there's one day a year you should never launch things April first. Yeah. So he picks April first to, to launch, uh, and 
Uh, and it wasn't really a launch. It was just he was gonna. It was really a punishment. He was gonna punish the existing customers, the most loyal, best customers of his, for for having a check mark on April first. Um, okay, great. I'm looking forward to this launch where I lose my check mark. Sounds great. Uh, then yeah. he um, April first comes and goes and nothing happens. So he mm-hmm. misses his launch date. After he pre announces the launch date, then misses it. This is you know I I'm just astounded at this point as to what's going on. Um, and then he finally gets around to it, I think, on April 20th, so the 420 joke, which is not really funny anymore. And um, and they just botch it horribly, where they basically, um, uh, you know, start turning off people's check marks. The only people who do get check marks are right-wing lunatics. And um, mm-hmm. and he starts abusing people on Twitter. He starts giving it to free to, like, LeBron James, who didn't ask for it. It causes a whole new media kerfuffle around it. And I'm sitting here. I have eight dollars. I could. I love Twitter, and there is zero chance I will ever use it. So he had. The, he took the most loyal customers and turned them 180 degrees around against his new product. So huh. it's just astounding, like n- epic levels of failure. It is crazy. Hey, did you notice on April 1st he also changed the logo of Twitter to Doge? Yes. That's funny. Yeah. I'll give him that. That's funny. Whatever. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and the same day, he was like, oh, let's launch something. And I was like, yeah. huh. Okay. Okay. So, which one is real? So, he, which he is, is real. Yeah. Which one is real? So, maybe forever change. Yes. So forever. He also, uh, there's even more nuance here. So, he also launched something which I think is kind of innovative, which is this badge idea. So, his idea is like there'll be an organizational uh, badge. Like, mm-hmm. every, all the New York Times writers could have the New York Times badge. Um, and, okay. Once again, that's actually maybe a good idea. Um, he um, he charges a lot for it. I think it's a thousand dollar entry point, um, mm-hmm. and and he um, uh, apparently didn't like do any pre sale so he wasn't able to launch and say, you know, you, a lot of times when you launch, you want to have reference customers. You want to say like, hey, this new thing's coming out, and guess what? Yeah. Nike's using it already. Like that's that gives yeah. you a lot of credibility. He doesn't do mm-hmm. that. He just launches it like the All In podcast is the only one that has it, and uh-huh. um, and he starts once again like berating people like that. The reason you know someone one of his henchmen was saying like, oh, you don't really need to pay the eight dollars because your company will pay for it, and the companies are like, huh. I'm not pay for that. Why would I pay for yeah, that? Yeah, like, because what, what's the, what is the benefit? Like, give me a benefit. Like, name one benefit besides have just having a stupid badge next to your name. All right. Anyway, so I, I'm sorry I ranted on your video, but like it gets me kind of worked up how bad this is. Uh, I know um, this can go for hours, and so let, let's do this. <laughs> let's let's learn from someone better. So, what's your favorite product that launched so successfully, follow the right methodology, have a great impact? What did yeah. they do right this time? Yeah. Um, so one one idea that came to mind, um, I think in general, there's this movement towards PLG, product led growth, um, and mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. The, the the and product led growth has a lot less of a aggressive launching. It's more like PR and a lot of email. Um, but what's important is that you you find the niche that really needs your product and you really. Uh, address it to them. So one product mm-hmm. that's been coming up a lot under the radar or starting to raise in the radar is called Linear. And Linear is mm-hmm. a um, is a um, ticketing tool for engineers and product groups. Um, and you may think there are a million of those. Everyone has Jira. Everyone has you mm-hmm. know, Trello. There's a lot of them. Uh, but yeah. what Linear has done is like put design first and made it incredibly you know, elegant the way the whole process works. Mm-hmm. And they're getting quite a bit of traction in the market. And, and I think that um, what's very yes. smart about what they do is most of the other pro- product, uh, most of the other product development engineering tools are really oriented towards the managers. Or the 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 reason you use Jira is not to help the engineers; it's to help the engineering managers keep track of things. And mm-hmm. I think uh, Linear has kind of flipped that and really focus on small teams, bottoms up PLG, um, and it's really going to their benefit. And most most kind of newer startups are using it. So I really like the strategy there. I mean, it wasn't so flashy mm-hmm. that they did a big, you know, announcement or anything, but the strategy is very sound. Okay, so let's let's break it down a little bit. Because mm-hmm. they target they want they want to find people really falling in love with the product. Yeah. Target at individual engineers first before they push yeah. over to their manager and have the manager pay for it. 
Yeah, right? startups, they're going bottoms up from startups, very mm -hmm. small teams, and then growing with them. I think the realization is that it, no matter how good your product is, it's very hard to get someone to switch off of Jira. You know, if you already are using Jira and you have hundreds of tickets and all this customized workload, yeah. it's very hard to switch. So mm -hmm. uh, instead, what you have to do is is go for the next generation of startups, um, which and uh, completely and try new to one. Get, get them when they're start. Yeah, completely new. Ah, so like next Google or next whatever diff Hopefully, different thing. Maybe your them. company, yeah, right? Maybe. Uh, yeah, maybe. and and then those will start grow. So we grow with the company together. So how long has the company linear been around? Uh, I think a couple of years. I'm not that familiar mm -hmm. with them uh, personally. Um, the uh, they come up because I've just. It seems like every startup I talk to is using them in some form. So they they seem nice. to you know uh, percolate up. Uh, I guess the other one that's coming up a lot is uh, you know obviously ChatGPT had a, an amazing. <laughs> launch. Uh, so what, what they, what's interesting there is like, you know, um, the product being just mind blowing, yeah. right? You know, so it's easy. It's sort of easy to launch when you have a mind blowing product. Uh, yeah. But um, in addition to the mind blowing product, they've actually done a pretty nice job of having a steady drum of additional releases. So they didn't just do chat GPT. They mm -hmm. uh, announced Three, within four. a week, I think of it, a subscription product. So which yeah. has grown to over $100 million already. Uh, and then they've they release 4.0 and then they release whisper there's kind of audio transcri transcribing um, mm -hmm. I, I'm actually a really big believer as a product person that um, having more announcements is very good uh, rather than fewer now I know we talked about Apple once a year they do everything once a year but that's kind of a spectacle especially mm -hmm. for B2B thing customers I hear this over and over again the like, customers love it when they see the incremental progress like oh that mm -hmm. bug I reported two months ago it finally got fixed great like they right. believe in you more if they see you're working on things because if you if you've ever used like a big product like a mm -hmm. you know, workday or Outlook yeah. you feel sometimes like this piece of garbage hasn't changed Forever. in years does anyone even exactly. work there that's, uh, does anyone even work at Workday? What do they do all day? Like, what what is it like to be an engineer at Workday? You know, that, exactly. uh, and so you don't want your customers thinking that way. Yeah, I, I always complain to my student who works for Microsoft regarding, like, I use Microsoft product a lot for, for teaching purposes, OneNote yep. and like stuff. I was like, so what we're doing the live teaching inside of PM Accelerator, I was like, and it was like, doesn't go up, doesn't go up. And then I have a student, his senior product manager at Microsoft was like, uh, can you create a ticket? He was like, I feel the same kind of pain as well. I was yes. like, don't tell others I work for Microsoft. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's, yeah. It, it's, that's like, it's part of the old generation product, now new product trying to take over, and that's where the, the uh, revolution is coming. Yeah, yeah. This and, and this is where you sometimes have a challenges with the marketing team as a product mm -hmm. manager. So um, marketing team may say, like, well, we don't want to send a customer email every week about product. Exactly. Right. We're, it gets in the way of our growth emails. We send all these complex chains of emails of growth and usage. And you're like, yeah. but I have new stuff to announce. That's old stuff. Yeah. Like, well, how do I get the new stuff out? And marketing mm -hmm. will often like push back and say, like, ah, just you know, put out a, a uh -huh. blog post instead, and no one's going to see that, right? Exactly. So, so that's a kind of important question about what is your product comm strategy, and is product and marketing on the same page about that? I have the realized pain point as to what you describe right now. Actually, for PMA ourselves, we have so many different kind of new launches of our mm -hmm. own like like training program well by the way right. we do have a uh, two-sided marketplace we have b2b and b2c side of marketplace b2b is like recruiting services b2c is like training services and then right. once we have both sides we plan to launch our software product so now we're just growing users first um but because we're growing we have so many new like features on our roadmap and now yeah every single week that we have a new like new thing coming out I have new job referrals and like new courses like different kind of power skills and pro vip mm -hmm. different things and now my marketing manager always come back saying that hey nancy we're gonna spam our users yeah you're yeah. right it's like product and marketing need to be aligned and this is like constant struggle we had you yeah. want to grow fast but you don't want to spam them right Right, right. Or mm. uh, if you're in an international organization, you'll often get feedback like, well, we don't have the resources to send uh, multi-language announcements. It's like, well, so I guess we don't care about the Korean users. Like last time I checked, we have an office in Korea. Like, are they doing anything? Like, do you, they just don't care? <laughs> 
right. it's, it's great. That's why people need better organization tools regarding launching right. product. Now, everything makes sense now. Awesome. Yeah, launch um, science. <laughs> Yeah, launch science. Yes, uh, guys, go to launch science, and they are accepting, uh, like beta users, right? Yeah, wait list uh, for your company. Right now. This is awesome. Yeah, so awesome. we have a bunch of people using it, but if you sign up for the wait list, um, I'll be in touch personally. Cool, awesome, great, cool. Uh, Ari, I do want you a quick comment regarding Google's activities shutting down their six product in Q one twenty twenty three. Yeah. So I know some of the product w was launched, especially my favorite one was Google. Uh, Google Side View, Google Street View. Mm -hmm. So Google Street View app, it started for like more than 10 years, 12 years, something that they, yeah. they, they remove it. Um, I understand as a product, they're only available for two years. They took it down. Um, how companies actually decide when to take down product and uh, mm -hmm. what really costs company just shut down product? I think it's a good discipline to shut down products. I, I, mm. I'm, I'm all for shutting Tell down or uh, products that are, you know, distracting, that are difficult to work with, um, mm -hmm. difficult to support. Um, because you have, you have a bunch of problems. It distracts the marketplace. They get confused about what the products mm -hmm. are. But also internally, you end up you know, siphoning off all the, all the great engineers and product managers, and you end up with products that no one really wants to work on uh, because they're not doing very well. Um, so so there's, in a big company especially, it's kind of necessary to do that. Um, mm -hmm. I think they'll, the, the danger, and I think this is very true for Meta, Facebook, is mm -hmm. that if you do it too much and too often, you get a boy who cries wolf problem where people don't take your new product development seriously. Um, so, True. you know, uh, I know you bring up Google, but I think Meta is kind of maybe even a better example here. They, you I, know, I think in so. the yeah, they they announced a audio clubhouse competitor, shut it down. They announced a mm -hmm. newsletter Substack competitor, shut it down. Right? They go through these pretty fast, and the problem is like the Substack example. They need mm -hmm. they need people with with mailing lists to to join. And yeah. why would you do that? Why would you say I'm going to put my business on Meta when over and over again they've shown that they have a pretty short attention span for these new products? Right? Exactly, um, and it, it's a, it's a real problem for them. They've lost most of their credibility in the media business, uh, and that seems important to them. I think Google is a little bit more like since most of their products are B two C, right? Mm -hmm. They um, it, it it's less risk, less danger to shutting th something down. But if you aggregate it, it's a huge amount of effort they've spent building these things that have nowhere to go. Exactly, and especially when they build something, they hire the best yeah. engineer ever. Yeah. Right pay them and, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year um, yeah. and they're building stuff no one wants. Have you ever heard of the expression lick the cookie? No, what does it mean? Yeah, so Google, so lick the cookie means that if, let's say there's a, an idea people have like, um, like virtual reality. Um, and if you're ambitious at Google, what you do is you announce or start an initiative around virtual reality so that other mm. people can't do it because you're doing it. It's called licking the cookie. Once you lick a cookie, no one else wants it, right? So, <laughs> so the ambitious product managers like will say, "Well, I'm in charge of like Google Drive, and we have a virtual reality initiative, so I really need to be in charge of virtual reality." And then the person who's in charge of the Android will be like, "Well, it has to be part of the phone, so I'm in charge of virtual reality." And everyone licks the cookie, and it causes it causes like the right solution to never be reached because the right people are not in the room. Holy crap! So much like insider secret and dirty secret. Yeah. A big time yeah. Come. <laughs> oh, this is crazy. Wow. Mm, I, well, well, that's part of the, the typical Fortune 500 companies, how they grow. I guess other non Google comp non fine companies probably have similar type of issues as well. Yeah, I'm sure. It's crazy. Cool. Yeah. So, um, all right. What's your opinion of the importance of growth mindset and investing in yourself? We've been talking about growing product and launching mm -hmm. product. Uh, lots of time people ask me questions regarding, hey, Nancy, what's your opinion on investment? And actually my response is like investing in yourself. I believe it's the best investment. So what's mm -hmm. your opinion regarding uh, growth mindset, investing in yourself, um, how, how it has impact you, yourself or people around you? Well, I think that for the most part, product managers, the product management mm -hmm. profession is filled with a lot of ambitious people. Um, yes. And that's because, um, first of all, the, the profession didn't exist when I started my career. It just sort of showed up in the mid 90s at some point. Um, <laughs> and um, and it, it tended to find people, it's a hard job, right? It's not 
Engi engineering is a hard job, but it's a discipline. You go to school for it, you do it. Um, mm -hmm. Product management is not. It's uh, rare that people have an education in product management yeah. you know, in undergrad. Um, mm -hmm. And so it finds these ambitious, ambitious people in deeply ambiguous situations. Um, mm -hmm. And so the people who get ahead in the career are the ones who ask for help and questions. And they say to their boss, right. like, what do you expect me to do in this job? Like, I'm just a product manager. I could release products, but what are the KPIs? Like you brought this up earlier. What are mm -hmm. the KPIs that product management should be um, evaluated on? And, you know, there are often also are skill gaps. So um, in uh, there's been this big movement over the last like 20 years to make product managers more technical. Um, mm -hmm. So back in the first generation, a lot of people had more MBA type backgrounds. Um, now product managers are expected to be more technical, but that doesn't come naturally to everybody or people may have rusty skills and you need to get the skills. Like you can't just sit around saying, well, I'm not technical. I don't know how to use SQL, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's not going to help your career, right? You have exactly. to actually do it. You have to have, you have to invest in yourself to get mm -hmm. the skills you need to do the job you want to do. Um, the, um, the, the biggest career path for product management is to become CEOs of your own companies. The best yeah. product managers become CEOs. That's, um, and that's great. That's great, but that's also a big leap that not everyone's prepared for. Not everyone can do for financial and you know mm -hmm. personal reasons, um, and also so the risk involved. Risk involved, absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, going from product management, if you don't have an MBA, if you don't have the business background, and you're more technical. You go into a product, and you go into becoming a CEO. You may not be there on the marketing and sales side. You may not mm -hmm. feel comfortable doing cold sales or schmoozing or doing all the things that are required to be a good CEO. Um, so, sure. um, so you need to learn those things and you know, there's only one way and to learn those things. Yeah. Just continue to grow together. And mm -hmm. Ari, thank you so much for sharing all the insider tips to help everybody yes. to grow together. Um, so one last question, how mm -hmm. would the audience be able to find you and reach out to you? I'm like very you. easy to reach. Um, my Twitter handle is down on there. It's uh, Ari Pap. That's probably the easiest way. I'm on LinkedIn. I actually mm -hmm. have my phone number on LinkedIn, and everyone thinks I'm crazy for doing that. Um, so if you need to reach me, go to LinkedIn, and you can text me. Don't call. Are you text. <laughs> okay, 3 a.m. That would be me. Okay, FYI. <laughs> you don't know. So many people think it's a joke. The, uh, the most common text I get is, this isn't really you, right? I'm like, yeah, it's just my phone number. No biggie. What do you want? How can I help you? Oh. Wow, wow. We will definitely test out and send text. them. Don't call. Send them text. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So I'm Texas 3 a.m. We will. Yeah. Awesome. Yes. I'm gonna. I will. Oh, I will link all the um, contact information already in the description of the show note. And everyone who watch up live through YouTube uh, live, LinkedIn live will also put in the description as well. Okay. So now everybody. So we are going to jump into private Q and A with Ari. If you're part of Product Insiders, or you should already uh, get the link of Zoom link for private. Um, insider uh, like a talk with Ari and we have a short period uh, for his time and anybody who is uh, interested in PM Accelerator feel free to go to our next master class which is also in the description of this show notes and video as well we're gonna see you soon in our private discussion awesome so Ari yeah. so let's do this thank you so much for joining us um, everyone make sure to like share this video and, and also bring more aspiring um, prime managers to join our uh, insider podcast discussion Awesome. All right, thank, thank you, you Dr. Lee. It was awesome. Thank you, Ari. Okay, great, cool. Um...